Hello and welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 4 Diploma in Procurement and Supply. This is Module 7, Whole Life Asset Management and it's Learning Outcome 2, which is to understand the key elements of effective inventory control. So we're going to differentiate between the different classifications of inventory, direct and indirect costs of holding inventory and techniques associated with inventory control. So here are some of the following types of inventory. We've got things like raw materials, which are basic input materials that have to be limited or no prior processing. We've got secondary components, products acquired in a process state that are combined with others to produce a finished good. Work in progress, stock partway through manufacture, but not completely finished. Then you've got finished goods, goods which are complete and ready to be used or sold. Safety or buffer stock, which is stock, could be work in progress or finished stock that's kept as a buffer to smooth out any disruptions of unexpected demand. A stock out is when you run out of stock. Obsolete stock is often finished goods where demand is irreversible or falling towards zero, like food ingredients which are out of date. Redundant stock is oversupply in its current location. There is a potential demand for it, but just not where it currently is. It can be redirected to other users. Direct supplies are supplies that are directly incorporated into a finished product. And indirects are supplies that are not incorporated into a product or will be sold to a customer. So these supplies are required to keep the business functioning, like machine spares, IT equipment and stationery. And then opening stock is an asset, a fit specifically in a current asset, since it's expected that the asset will be used up in whole or in part in the current period. You won't see it on a balance sheet, though, this, though since the balance sheet contains the assets that are present at the end of an accounting period, not at the beginning. That said, remember that opening stock is simply the previous accounting period's closing stock, which means that the figure does soon appear on the balance sheet the name of which is different, but the main relationship between opening stock and closing stock is on the balance sheet. Now that term work in progress in a supply chain management term is describing partly finished goods awaiting completion. It refers to raw materials, labour and overheads incurred for products that are at various stages of the production process. So work in progress is a component of the inventory asset account on the balance sheet where costs are subsequently transferred to the finished goods account and eventually to the cost of sales. So this is one of the components on a company's balance sheet and the figure reflects only the value that those products or some intermediate production stage which excludes the value of raw materials not yet incorporated into an item for sale. The figure also excludes the value of finished products being held in inventory in anticipation for future sales. Finished goods are goods that have been completed by the manufacturing process or purchased in a completed form, but which have not yet been sold to the customer. So they're seen to have reached their highest value since being manufactured from raw materials and constructed from component parts. The finished goods inventory is considered a short term asset since the expectation is that these items will be sold in one year or less. Obsolete stock is the term referred to inventory that has reached the end of its product life. The end of the product life cycle is, a typical determined, is typically determined based on a set period of time with no sales for a specific product offering. Whereas redundant stock refers to inventory items placed by an alternative or rendered unusable or is perhaps diminishing in value. They've either been discarded or sold at a highly discounted price. Direct supplies are those that can be easily identified, measured and directly charged to the cost of production. It's also part of the finished product. So examples of direct materials include timber for furniture making or leather for shoemaking 
or rubber in tyre manufacturing. Indirect supplies are those materials that cannot be converted and cannot be conveniently identified and allocated to a cost centre or a unit. So examples of the indirect materials might include your tools, safety equipment and operating supplies used in the manufacture of goods. Now the ABC classification of stock is based on the Pareto principle, which is also known as the 80-20. 80% 80 of stock value will be held in 20% of the items. And that can be used to differentiate how each category or part should be managed. So category A likely to form 20% of your total number of parts, but may account for 80% of the cost. So it should be closely managed and controlled with daily actions. It needs good stock control, adjusted demand for seasonal variances. You need to be responsive and have agile suppliers to keep production facilities working, while ensuring that capital is not tied up in warehouses full of category A stock. Now category B likely to form 30% of your parts, but only account for 15% of the cost. So they require less attention with weekly or monthly checks. But tight controls and tracking are still important but balancing the risk of stock out against using buffer stock here is less of a financial challenge as the stock value in type B are far less than the type A's. So holding buffer stock is easier to justify since it ties up less working capital. And then category C, likely to form 50% of your item parts but account for only 5% of the cost. And usually ordered as required with frequent orders often in large batch sizes. Monitoring and controlling such an item of large part numbers of low value can be done by having a simple stock reordering system, using a minimum stock level with a larger ordering quantity. Alternatively, this tail end spend could be outsourced to a supplier to manage and coordinate on your behalf. Now let's take a look at another example. A dependency tree can be created to demonstrate independent and dependent demand. In this instance, the finished independent product is a car. The car will require four doors and a tailgate. The demand will be dependent on the demand for the number of cars. The car will also require an engine. The engine will require cylinder heads. The number of heads is dependent on the number of engines which are dependent on the number of cars and so on. Now acquisition costs can be categorised into three main groups, preliminary costs, placement costs and post placement costs. The pre preliminary costs are associated with the actions that take place before raising the purchase order. So example would be preparing a requisition and supply selection approvals. Placement cost is the cost of raising the purchase order and checking to ensure the supplier receives it. It also includes the cost of the stock itself. And post-placement costs are costs that are incurred after the product or the purchase order has been raised. So in order to get the goods to the, requ to the, requ requester, the requester sorry, and the payment to the supplier, you'll have to receive, receive the goods and have the approval and payment of invoices. But there are some issues in measuring these costs. The cost of the stock itself depends upon the amount purchased. And the amount of time and cost involved in placing the order is theoretically the same for any quantity, though there may be small variations in practice since higher value orders may need to be authorised by more, more senior person in the organisation. And while it takes time to authorise a requisition of the same for an exec director, as the purchasing manager, the cost of the director's time is higher since they have a higher salary. Now, holding and carrying costs are costs associated with storage and handling of inventory. There are two categories, the value of the stock and inventory and the physical characteristics. But the value of the stock holding and inventory are financial costs such as interest on the working capital that's tied up in stock insurance and the cost of losses due to product deterioration, obsolescence and redundancy of inventory, or it could be due to theft or accidental damage. 
And then the physical characteristics is the storage of the cost of the space, which includes rent, maintenance and the repairs of the building, the storage racking, power, heating, lighting, the movement equipment like the forklift and pallet lift trucks, the cost of labour to run, handle, inspect and audit the use of inventory and the admin costs such as the cost of maintaining the stores and the records. And the holding costs can be the hardest to calculate because they're often the costs that are not very visible and are hidden in general overheads. So identifying the holding costs is the first step towards better utilisation of storage space and inventory to lower the cost per unit stored. The cost of stockouts are economic consequences of not being able to meet an internal or external demand from your current inventory. Such costs consist of internal costs like delays, labour time wastage or loss of production and external costs such as the loss of profit from loss of sales and loss of future profit due to loss of goodwill. In other words, your customers will go elsewhere. So what option do we have to reduce costs while mitigating any negative impact on service delivery? Cost reduction can be achieved through inventory optimization and maintaining minimum cost of average stock on hand while achieving higher desired service levels of the items being optimized. Resource efficiency through waste reduction and better planning and forecasting and reduce rejects through analysis, involvement and control. You can reduce losses through policies, procedures and tighter security and create savings through more efficient use of energy. Now, the subjective forecasts are more qualitative. These approaches rely most heavily on judgment and educated guesses since there is little data available for forecasting. This is especially the case in long range forecasting. It's easy to forecast next week's sales of an ice cream and possibly even the individual flavours since you're likely to have months or even years of past weekly ice cream sales data. However, if you're trying to get an idea of what ice cream consumption or flavour preferences will be 10 years from now, quantitative approaches will be of little or no use. Changes in tastes, technology and political, economic or social factors occur and can dramatically alter the course of trends. The Delphi method is often used in these situations. Now, the formation of a team to undertake and monitor a Delphi on a subject will be selection of one or more panels to participate in the exercise. The panelists are experts in their area to be investigated. The development of the first round of the Delphi questionnaire is a testing questionnaire for proper wording, making sure there's no ambiguities or vagueness. The transmission of the first questionnaire to the panelist and then the analysis of those first rounds. You've then got the preparation and second round questions and possible testing and the transmission of that second round to the panelist, which clearly then has, has analysis of the second round of responses. And then finally, the preparation of the report by the analysis team to present the conclusion of the exercise. Objective forecasting approaches are quantitative in nature and lend themselves well to abundance of data. The approach can identify trends from the data. Causal or ecometric forecasting methods attempt to predict outcomes based on changes in factors that are known or believed to impact those outcomes. So for example, temperatures may be used to forecast the sale of ice cream. Advertising expenditure may be used to predict sales or the unemployment rate might be used to forecast the incidence of crime in the neighborhood. But data gathered repeatedly over time will give you a trend, a steady trend that's not changing, fluctuating, which is volatile, a rising trend seeing a steady pace going up and a falling trend which is a steady pace going down. There are three common reorder methods that are used for independent demand. Fixed order quantities, the EOQ, 
and time or periodic review. Fixed order quantities have the same predetermined amount requested for each order. The order level considers the quantity that will be used during the order lead time plus a safety margin. In technology-based systems, an IT system tracks inventory usage and triggers the fixed order to be placed once stock falls below a certain point. And it works well if the stock is used at an inconsistent rate. The EOQ is an ideal or optimum order quantity. It's designed to minimize ordering and holding costs. The formula considers demand, the ordering costs of holding inventory, to calculate the ideal quantity of inventory for a given product. The formula makes a number of assumptions which often do not hold true in reality, but it works best for repeated purchases of MRO items. And then the time or periodic review uses time-based stock replenishment triggers rather than specific quantity signals. The relative importance of the stock item determines the frequency of the checks. For example, type A stocks are checked daily, type B weekly, type C monthly. And the formula used to determine the maximum stock level considers the average rate of stock used, the review period, the item order lead times and the volume of safety stock. A variable quantity will be ordered to bring stock back to a particular level, topping up the stock. This system is most appropriate when orders and supplies have regular delivery intervals. So what reorder methods are used for the items that you're responsible for? Materials Requirement Planning, or MRP, was developed in the 1970s to help manufacturing companies better manage their production and the procurement of the materials to support the manufacturing. These systems translate the master production schedule into components and raw materials demanded by splitting the top level assembly into the individual parts and quantities. This is known as a bill of materials. It's basically a list of ingredients, a list of components. But they also then looks at the inventory stock on hand before telling you what needs to be ordered and when. MRP2 is manufacturing resource planning, which goes several steps beyond MRP. While MRP stopped at receiving bay, MRP2 incorporates the value stream all the way through the manufacturing facility to the shipping bay, where the product is packaged and sent to its customer. The value stream includes production planning, machine capabilities, demand forecasting and analysis modules, as well as quality tracking tools. MRP2 also has tools for tracking employee attendance, labour consumption, contribution and productivity. And an ERP system stands for Enterprise Resource Planning the latest development of MRP and MRP2. It's used to plan organizational wide resource requirements by using technology to capture and assist in analyzing real-time data from all functional areas across the organization. It facilitates information flow across and between all functions, creating a more coherent focus on the performance of an organization rather than on individual departments or teams. The capabilities of an ERP system will include human resources, recruitment, planning, training, procurement and supply chain. So the P2P cycle, from requisition to paying supply invoices, supply performance measures, timeliness of deliveries, order lead times, defects, etc. It also has the capabilities of logistics and inventory management, warehouse locations, delivery tracking, plus all of MRP2's outputs. And then finance, accounts payable and accounts receivable, cost management, financial reporting, payroll and budgeting. Manufacturing, it tracks and reports all orders through the end-to-end -end production process, plus all of the MRP and MRP2 outputs. It can do project management, planning, resource planning, project costing, time and expense. 
performance units and activity management. And finally, engineering. All drawings, change requests, material specifications are stored in one database, allowing access for all. Now, Just In Time is a production control and inventory management system for producing and developing the right items at the right time in the right amounts. It aims to eliminate wastes in five areas known as the five zeros. Zero defects. Using the TQM teaches Deming of JIT, which aims to have all products meet or exceed the customer's quality requirements. Zero setup times. No or reduced times for production lines and machinery, so there is less or ideally none in terms of downtime where machine lines are not producing anything, which in turn means shorter production times, shorter lead times, while holding lower inventories. Techniques used to support setup time reduction include single minute exchange of dies and the teaching of Shingeo Shingo. Zero inventories is JIT aims to reduce batch sizes to a quantity of one. So a single flow of piece, a single piece flow. In practice, this is unlikely to be achieved, but as batch sizes are reduced, all of the typical types of inventories like raw materials and work in progress are reduced. So no safety or buffer stock is needed. Zero handling is the process mapping of tools to identify where operations are duplicated, systems that are redesigned to reduce or eliminate handling operations. And then zero lead times. This is the ultimate aim of JIT, which is difficult to achieve. Optimising small batch sizes coupled with increased flexibility due to shorter lead times. And the benefits of JIT is that if materials or components are produced or acquired immediately before they're needed, then they're not being held in stores and all the costs associated with stock holding is eliminated. You reduce scrap costs, right first time, faster response to engineering changes, reduce back office costs, better productivity, and reduced inventory of purchased parts. Now, one of the things procurement could do better is getting better value for money. And that aim is to reduce the input cost and reduce waste with lean thinking. Tashio Ono identified seven types of waste that describe all activities that add cost but no value. A process adds value, but producing goods or services that a customer will pay for but a process consumes resources and waste occurs when more resources are consumed than are necessary to produce the goods or provide the service that a customer really wants. These seven ways are categorized of unproductive manufacturing or production practices identified by Tashio Ono, the father of Toyota production system. And this can be easily remembered using the name Tim Wood. Tim for transport inventory and motion and Wood for waiting, overproduction, overprocessing and defects. Inventory performance measures are things like lead times, service levels, rate of stock run, stock outs or anything like that in a given period. So a warehouse is all, all about relationships and the cause and effect that drive them. So for example, a delay in inventory management upstream leads to an unhappy customer downstream whose request has been put on the back order. That's where key performance indicators come in. They enable the warehouse to stay on top of issues and even predictive, predictively and proactively manage the future through inventory performance measures, including time, service, throughput and available stock. They provide good information that's needed to move faster, deliver sooner and please customers and project, product markets. That's the end of Learning Outcome 2. Thank you for watching.